thou shalt not commit adultery. Now, I don't know whether, uh, as has just been mentioned, that I'm brave in tackling it. It was, it, it was like as if I had no option. Uh, this was landed uh, in my lap, and uh, actually, all jokes aside, it's going to be a great privilege to tackle this subject because it is something that we don't often hear talked about in church. Uh, when did you last hear a sermon about marriage or uh, how to um, keep your marriage uh, happy and content and not looking elsewhere? When did you last hear a sermon about that or about the warnings of committing adultery, the things to be aware of? When did you last hear that spoken about? God gave the commandments to us so that we can avoid all of these pitfalls, uh, doing damage to ourselves and doing damage to those around us. He gave us these laws for right living and living in a way that pleases God. They are found in Exodus chapter 20 and verse uh, 3 to 17. And you have already been tackling um, many of them, and I've drawn the short straw to do this one today. So let's have a quick recap. You will have no other gods before me. You will not make any graven images. You will not take the name of the Lord in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and mother, which is what Glenn did last time. Um, and then there are five, thou shalt not Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, and thou shalt not cover. And the more I've looked at those last five, they are absolutely all connected together. Because at a time when you feel like killing your partner, or throttling them, or wringing their neck, okay, that's just me, okay, at a time when you just want to wring their neck, at that time, do not commit adultery, whether in your head or in your heart or with your body. When you feel like killing them, do not commit adultery, because that would lead you to number eight. That is stealing. Committing adultery is stealing something else that isn't yours. And you will probably then need to do number nine, to lie, to cover your tracks, and you will also need to do number 10, which is covet, which is wanting something which actually isn't yours to have. So there's something about do not commit adultery that also includes do not kill, do not um, steal, do not lie, and do not covet. They're somehow all connected. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill your own marriage and your own healthy relationship and somebody else's. Thou shalt not kill those vows uh, that you have made. You, sh you mustn't steal. It's a law of the land and it's a law of God. We can't have what isn't ours. And you mustn't lie in order to cover your tracks because to lie, one lie leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. Lying gets us in a terrible mess. And you shall not cover, you shall not think about what isn't yours and want it to be uh, your own. So we're going to look at uh, this morning, what is adultery? Uh, why does God hate adultery? And what are the different types of adultery? And then as I uh, wrap my th uh, thoughts up at the end, I want to then uh, talk about how to affair-proof our marriages for those uh, who are married, or how to affair-proof our relationships. So what is adultery? Adultery is basically breaking the promises that we have made in marriage, breaking promises and covenants that we have made before God. That word adultery in the Bible literally means, it's, it's the uh, Hebrew word na'af, N-A-A-P-H. It means to break away. It means to sever and to make a break. Adultery is basically straying off. It's wandering off, whether literally or metaphorically, it is going to a place that you and I shouldn't go to. Adultery is sexual union between a married man or woman and someone that he or she is not married to. It's not necessarily two married people. It's, it's, it's the breaking of a marriage union with someone that you are not married to. And why does God hate adultery so much? 
Well, he created marriage, and I give my apologies to anyone in the room today who is not married, who would like to be married, who hopes to be married, who once was married. If you are widowed, if you are on your own, if you've gone through a situation of breakup, my my heart goes out to you as we unpack these scriptures. But if you could just hang on with me, I hope that you too will find something here uh, that would be helpful to you this morning. God created marriage as the building block of creation and of society. Marriage is a sacred union. In a marriage, a man and a woman come together and they complete one another and they complement one another as they take their journey together. In our vows, we learn that marriage is the ideal vehicle through which God designed uh, the preservation of the human race. We call it procreation having babies and having uh, being blessed with a family who will continue uh, in, in God's ways. Such a high premium is placed upon God, marriage uh, that God seeks to protect it at all costs. This is why it breaks his heart uh, when adultery happens. This is why he prohibits adultery which violates um, this marriage union. Secondly, God says, do not commit adultery because he wants people who will be holy. Leviticus 11.14 says, be holy um, for I am holy. God doesn't want his people to behave in a way that copies the behavior of the people around them. Everyone else around us is having affairs and breaking commitments they have made, uh, whether they are just relationship commitments or marriage commitments. Everyone around us is doing it. We see it on the television screens. So why can't we do it? It's because God wants us to be holy. God wants us to behave in a way that is different to the people around us. Adultery and other sexual sins were really common in the Israelites, the people to whom God gave these commandments. Uh, And adultery itself rips apart the fabric of society. It tears apart marriages, it tears apart families, and it's incredibly damaging and and has a long-lasting effect. So God wants to protect us from that pain and he wants to protect us from everything uh, damaging that goes with it so there are different types of adultery there is the the literal physical adultery which is the breaking of the covenant of marriage uh, by going with somebody else there is emotional and mental adultery we'll look at that in a minute and there is also spiritual Adultery when we wander off and stray from, from God and break our, our commitments and vows that we have made to him in relationship. Let's look at those three things. It's 31 years ago that I said these words. I, Sarah, take you, Glenn, uh, to be my lawful, not awful, lawful, <laughs> awful wedded husband. No, not awful, lawful. Uh, to be my lawful wedded husband, to have and to hold from this day forward for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death us to part, according to God's holy law. And the, the original vows say these words that nobody has got a clue what it means. And thereto I plight thee my troth. What on earth does that mean? Any idea? It basically means, and, 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 and to all of that, I give you my, my promise. Uh, and there too I plight thee my troth. In the presence of God, I make these vows. And that is what is so incredible when you're married. You've said vows, generally you have said vows in the presence of God. Uh, and therefore, at any point in our marriages, that very God to whom we have declared our vows, we can turn to him again for help, for, 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 for strength, for comfort, for guidance. The same God that heard those vows is the, is the God and is the Lord Jesus Christ who can help us when we hit sticky spots in our marriage and when things become a little bit tricky. Glenn uh, would have uh, had to say these words. Will you, uh, he would have heard these words. Will you have Sarah to be your wife? Will you love her? Will you comfort her and, and keep her? And then these words, forsaking all others, 
Remain true to her as long as you both shall live. When was the last time that you thought about the, the vows uh, that you made? When was the last time I thought about those vows and commitments that I uh, made to Glenn and we made to each other in the presence of God? See, adultery breaks God's heart. Adultery is so damaging to everyone involved and its consequences are far-reaching. The consequences of adultery just sort of go on year after year after year. Um, Proverbs 6 verse 32 says this, really interesting verse. It says this, he who commits adultery lacks sense. (laughs) Gosh, Proverbs is so full of um, real insight for everyday living. He who uh, commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. Hebrews 13, 4 says, Let marriage be held in honor among all. Let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. So whether we are single or whether we are married, whether we were once married, we have to remember that God judges us for our sins, but we also need to remember that God forgives us for our sins and can give us a new beginning, as we will look at in a few minutes. Having a crush on somebody else other than your spouse could be fun for a moment, but it has consequences. When you feel that hint of attraction to someone else, it is time to run for the hills. Get out of that situation as quick as you can. Proverbs 27 verse 12 says, The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. I'll read that again. The prudent see danger, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. As spouses, we must be aware of the danger in our own lives and in our own set of circumstances, and we must be aware of the danger to our spouses. I'm always on the lookout for uh, for, um, seductresses and predators who would even glance at my husband. I will knock you out. (laughs) I will take you out. (laughs) And I hope that Glenn will always be on the lookout um, for someone who would, you know, God forbid, but cast their eye on me. He would knock them out too. Because we must be not only aware of the dangers for ourselves, but aware of the dangers for our husband. I have in the past said to Glenn, be careful. Be careful with that individual. She, She would love to get her claws into you. And Glenn would say, what? What? He might not see it himself as a, just be careful, sweetheart, be careful. We have to look out for one another. We have to protect what we've got. We must not commit adultery. We must be aware of the dangers. Um, The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. Let's have an example here. Joseph in the Old Testament he, um, he was in the pit, he was then uh, in prison and in the palace, wasn't he? It's a wonderful, wonderful story in the book of Genesis. It spans uh, quite a number of chapters. And he finds himself in a situation where he was, he had a bit of a narrow escape with Potiphar's wife. She tried to entice him uh, into, into bed and then it says she grabbed his cloak and he, he, he fled, didn't he? Now, he fled and he ran from the temptation of of, of actually sleeping with Potiphar's wife. Uh, Let's just unpack that for a second. Uh, We must never leave our spouses vulnerable to, to wanting to be with someone else. So I half wonder, in her defense... In a, we always think, oh, she's such a baddie, she's, she's a bit of a tart, she was trying to grab Joseph, she was an older woman wanting to be with a handsome younger man, ta 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 so naughty. But what about, where was Potiphar? Busy? Preoccupied? Maybe he wasn't nurturing her, maybe he wasn't making love with her, maybe he was so caught up with his power and pomp and his responsibilities that she was low down in her priority. Along comes Joseph, a fine young man of good character. He compliments her, he takes interest in her, he serves that household, and her heart melts. And in her heart, she's she's taking the next step, thinking... 
you, you are being kind to me. You are hitting that spot inside of me. My husband is away on business all of the time, and I am left a bit bereft. I would like to take you to the bedroom. And so I half wonder whether she was left vulnerable. That's just me, my interpretation on it. But we must never leave our spouses vulnerable. And yes, Joseph was brave and courageous that he ran from that encounter. He didn't sleep with her, even though she grabbed his cloak and she made up all sorts of stories. He was brave and he ran away from the temptation. He could hold his head up high. He didn't succumb to her advances. That's a different set of circumstances to David. David, King David, shepherd boy David, David who fought Goliath. He, let's read some verses about him. He did succumb. He did succumb to the temptation of sleeping with another man's wife. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around the roof of a palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. At that point, he should have... Having glimpsed once, he should have run for the hills, shouldn't he? But he didn't. He glimpsed once, but when you look twice and when you look with intent, you are going down a slippery slope that might lead to something else. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, isn't that Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? She was a married lady. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her and she went back home. He did commit adultery. As a result of that encounter, adultery in and of itself breaks God's heart, does lasting damage, but God forgives sin. God forgives sin. David then writes many years later in Psalm 51, create in me a pure heart, O God. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Uh, uh, Don't cast me away from your presence. Doesn't he say those words? That Psalm is written as a result of his uh, adulterous situation with Bathsheba and God forgave him. God God did cleanse his heart. He did succumb, but all hope wasn't lost. Joseph didn't, but David did. But God was able to forgive him because of repentance. Paul says these words in 1 Corinthians 10, 12 to 13. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. We always need to know our way out. Whether that is blocking a a person on Facebook, whether that is withdrawing from close social contact, whether that is um, making a choice to step away, whether that is refusing an invitation, whether that is refusing an advance, whether that is not responding to an inappropriate text, there is always a way out. Let's ask God, what is my way out here? Uh, If you feel a little bit trapped or a little bit put in a corner, God will give you a way out. You need to find that way out of that situation that you know might do you harm. So there's literal adultery, the physical sexual adultery of two people coming together who are not, who, um, they're, they're not meant to be together. It's with somebody else's spouse, somebody else's husband or wife. But what about mental and emotional adultery. Jesus says these words, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. It might not be uh, with, with, uh, in, in a physical way, but adultery always begins in the heart. Do you ever find yourself thinking about somebody else? Do you feel more understood by them than your spouse? That could even be a friend. Do you compare them to your spouse? I wish my husband was a bit more like that. Wish my husband was a bit more helpful around the house like they are. Wish my husband spoke a bit nicer to me like they do. 
Are you frequently in contact with them? You are technically beginning the early stages of, of wandering off into your mind that are in, a, in a place that is not too healthy. In the first wave of COVID, I had to have my appendix out. And um, it's very interesting having a having a, a surgery in the height of COVID. All the restrictions were very different. I was wheeled to theatre in a wheelchair, and then I had to get out of the wheelchair and walk into theatre. Well, normally, you don't see it. You're normally in a little tiny room, aren't you? And then you don't see everything. I think, oh, I don't know whether I wanted to see all of this and the big team of people. And here I was walking into theatre, holding my gown together in the back. You know how it is, don't you? Massive team of people. And I'm sort of not forgetting I've got one hand. Now, this is when two hands would have been extremely, extremely useful. I had to yank myself up onto the operating theatre slab um, whilst holding my gown together uh, and do it elegantly. And, uh, so, and it seemed really quite high. I was trying not to make a bit of a fool of myself. I managed to get on this um, operating table and then um, this very handsome anaesthetist um, started talking to me, saying, right, we're going to put you to sleep now and my name is whatever... And uh, he put a candle in the back of my hand and then a little whiff of gas in there. And then he leaned over me with these gorgeous blue eyes. And son, he was obviously a surfy dude. He was probably about the age of my son, but that's beside the point. Blue eyes, sun-kissed skin. He was a probably a, you know, he was a Falmouth boy probably, wasn't he? So he was, he was peering over me like this. And then he says these words... Uh, right, you're just about to go to sleep. Now think about something nice. <laughs> and in, I was like, oh. Oh, I already am. <laughs> oh, sorry, Lord, I already was. Think I, was, I, was, I was engrossed in these blue eyes and this sun-kissed skin. And then I went to sleep and then I woke up and my surgery was done. But it begins, it begins with a thought. It begins with a seed. It begins with thinking something that you know you probably shouldn't be thinking. Do you know what? It all begins with a thought. You might think that the grass is greener on the other side. Do you know what? It's likely to be AstroTurf. <laughs> think the grass is greener. Look at them. Look at him. Look at her. If only, if only I was with that old flame, if only, if only this, if only that, or if only life was different, if only, you know. No, if you think the grass is greener, it's likely to be astroturf. Don't look over the fence. Your marriage and your relationships will suffer for it. Tend your own garden and make your own garden blossom and bloom. Bloom. Proverbs 6, 25 to 29 says this, Don't lust in your heart after her beauty or let her captivate you with her eyes. For a prostitute can be had for a loaf of bread, but another man's wife preys on your very life. Can man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? So is he who sleeps with another man's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. Paul commands us in, in um, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, that we are always encouraged to take captive every thought. When it begins in a thought, take captive of that thought and grab it and deal with it there and then. Don't let that thought um, um, become a, a desire, which becomes an action which has sometimes drastic consequences. Take captive every thought and guard your heart and guard your eyes. Be careful what you watch. Be careful what you read. Uh, maybe pull back on the escape fiction that, that we might sometimes get drawn into, where we think, oh, look, there's such a love story. It's so sexy. It's so full of romance. Be careful what you watch and be careful what you read, read because it fills your heart and your mind with things that perhaps are not so appropriate. And it doesn't free up your soul Tend your own garden and make it bloom. Thirdly, there is such a thing, I think, according to what I can see in the Bible, there is such a thing called spiritual adultery. There's a beautiful old hymn. No sermon of Sarah's is ever complete without quoting the verse of an old hymn. 
I make no apologies for that. There's a gorgeous old hymn that says, Come thou fount of every blessing. And there's a line in there that says, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, O oh, take and seal it. Seal it to thy courts above. There is something in us as human beings where we are prone to wander off and go where we shouldn't go and stray where we shouldn't stray. Jesus called the Jews in Matthew 12, 39, he called them an adulterous generation. They've wandered off from that beautiful commitment they were, that they will have made to God. They are committing adultery, whether in their mind and in their emotions or in a literal sense, severing any bonds of relationship with God, thinking that they know best. In, in, in Exodus, we read in the very first commandment that we must love the Lord our God uh, with, with all of our heart. Sometimes our eyes and our devotion and our loyalty can go elsewhere. We focus elsewhere. We've wandered away like the prodigal son thinking that we know best. But God wants us to follow him wholeheartedly, not half-heartedly and not lukewarm, loving God with all of our heart our mind and our strength. In the Ten Commandments, it says about having no other gods before me. And so spiritual adultery is possible where we wander away from God or where we we look elsewhere. Uh, We heard Louis saying earlier on about that lovely question that he was asking other people, where do you get your hope? What does hope mean to you? And, 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 and we, our, our hope is um, fixed in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And we can't afford to wander off from God and commit spiritual adultery with everything else around us, pulling us in all different directions. We need to stay on track because that's where uh, the blessing is. How to affair-proof your marriage. These are Sarah's top tips. Uh, I've given this talk this morning a a bit of thought and um, these these are my thoughts as I have um, just looked into it a a little bit. You know, to every every do not in the Ten Commandments, there are plenty of do's, you know, where, where, you know, people think, oh, I don't do religion, it's all do not this, do not that, do not that. Yes, the do nots are there to protect us, but for every do not, there are a hundred, please do. Please do enjoy relationships and marriages and friendships. Please do. God is, God is saying the do nots are just for our protection, but there are so many more do's than there are don'ts. God wants us to live at life to the full. 20 top tips. <laughs> Speak well of your spouse. Proverbs 31 talks about um, um, the, the, the virtuous woman. It talks about her husband speaks well of her at the city gates. Now, I don't need Glenn to compliment me. I think I cook, okay? If you come to my home, I, I love cooking. I love hospitality. I don't need him to compliment me for every meal. What would mean more to me is if I... If I if I get wind of the fact that Glenn has said to somebody else, God, oh, Sarah's a really good cook, actually. Uh, I love it when she makes Moroccan lamb in the slow cooker. Phew, delicious. If I get wind that he has, he has said something lovely about me to somebody else and speaks well of me, that does my heart good. I don't expect him to compliment me on, on, on every turn because he doesn't. And sometimes I have to ask for it. Was that nice? You know, you've just had seconds. I presume that was nice, was it? (laughs) Are you going to say anything? You know, I took a bit of effort on my part, you know. But speak well of your spouse. And when you remember, compliment your spouse and say, do you know what? That was delicious. Do it before they ask for it. Did you enjoy that? No, do it. Be ahead of the game and say, do you know what? Put your knife and fork down. Say, do you know what? That was blooming delicious. Nobody makes Moroccan lamb like you. And that will affair-proof your marriage. We hope. Learn to speak the the right language. Now, I come from Wales, and we have got our our own unique language. Oh, by the way, we won the rugby yesterday. (laughs) Just saying. 
Just saying. Anyway, moving swiftly on. Learn to speak the right language. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about the, the different love languages. Now, Glenn is, uh, Glenn's love language would be, Glenn feels really loved by me when I, when I, when I do things that are helpful for him. For example, uh, three weeks ago on a Saturday morning, he asked me to go to the bit of land that we rent because he wanted to trim his sheep's hoofs. Wow. Now, that is love. And he wanted me to help. And I had to help to get them into this pen and hold the fences while he was trimming the sheep's hoofs and injecting them with... with, um, I didn't want to be doing it, to be honest. Uh, It was muddy, it was a bit drizzly. But I'm thinking, I I want to do it because me helping him will will actually... (laughs) Me helping him trim his sheep's hoofs makes him feel loved. Can you work that one out? But we need to speak that language, or I know that me supporting him in that makes him feel valued and loved. When he sent me that beautiful birthday card with lovely words of affirmation and love a couple of weeks ago, that makes me feel really loved. We need to speak the right language to each other. Thirdly, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. I've learned this lesson through the years. There's been maybe two nights in our marriage life where I've... um, let, I have let the sun go down while I was still really cross. And you don't have the best night's sleep. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. You toss and turn, and you're like, Ugh, you're so tired, but you're too cross to sleep. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. That's the third piece of advice in order to help to affair-proof your marriage. I've said this one. Don't think that the grass is greener because it's astroturf, number four. Remember, number five, that love is, is a decision as well as a feeling. When we first perhaps fell in love with that spouse, um, it was a lot about feelings. Love is also a decision that we make uh, as well as a feeling that we feel. There are times when we have to dig deep and say, I choose to love you. (laughs) You've left a wet towel on the ensuite floor again. I want to throttle you. I choose to love you. I will pick it up. I will take it to the laundry myself. And I will choose to love you and not mention it to you (laughs) until today. And it's now on gone on a recording. (laughs) Number six, don't, this this is talking about sexual intimacy. Don't just lay back and dream of England. Go to paradise with your spouse. There we are. I'll move on quickly from that thought. (laughs) Next one, keep investing in the bank of marriage. Helping with sheep's hoofs uh, a week last Saturday morning. Uh, Talking of which, Glenn will never do me a pedicure. (laughs) But we spent all morning doing his sheep's hoofs. There we are. I'll also mention that onto the recording. (laughs) But keep investing into the marriage because it will reap dividends. Which leads on to the next one. Don't clock out. Like uh, factories years ago, you clock in. And you clock out. It is so easy to say in your head, I'm clocking out. I can't be bothered. I cannot be doing with this. I'm clocking out. Yeah, whatever. Don't clock out. Keep clocked in uh, and you will protect yourself from being vulnerable. When you clock out in your head, you are so vulnerable. Next one, forgive and keep on forgiving. Next one, remember it's give and take. Actually, it's a lot more about give and keep on giving. Next one, respect each other. Never do anything that really disrespects one another. Next one, remember that the marriage bed is undefiled uh, and this is God's gift so that you can enjoy each other. It it was fairly early on in our marriage, we've got four children, that we invested on a bolt on our bedroom door. And uh, that was a good investment, about one pound something from a hardware store. Remember that your bedroom and your marriage bed is undefiled. Never stop dating. That's a good one. I went on a pasty date with Glenn on Thursday lunchtime, about an hour and a half. We had a pasty sitting in the car, and it was very cute, and we caught up, and it was lovely. Never stop dating. He texted me saying, do you fancy a pasty? Uh, yes. Yeah. So that was, that was an invitation to a date, uh, and I accepted that invitation. Don't become complacent. 
There are those of you in the room who are, are, are widowed and, and, and on your own now. I know that you absolutely would endorse this. Never take each other for granted. Make the most of every single moment that you have got because you don't want to look back with regret and say, I wish I'd spent more time together. I wish we had done more together. Don't become complacent. Don't become so used, so familiar, so used to it, you're so used to your marriage. Uh, don't take each other granted, for granted. Enjoy every moment. Next, don't look elsewhere twice. I looked into the eyes of my dark, uh, uh, um, t- suntanned anaesthetist fleetingly uh, and with humour, but, but don't look twice. Make intimacy a priority. Give time for it. Don't just give that the dregs of your time and energy. Make it a priority. Next, nurture each other. Encourage each other. Appreciate each other. Next, run a mile from seducers. Next, don't make your spouse vulnerable. Maybe learn that lesson from Potiphar in the Bible. Last of all, Sarah's top tips, advice for a fair proofing uh, marriage. Last but not least, adultery is m- way more tempting in a loveless marriage. So keep uh, our marriages love filled and God centered. Phew, she did it! <laughs> she did it! <laughs> <laughs> Don't ever ask me to do difficult subjects ever again, or I'm not coming back here. I'm not going to play. Jesus says these words in John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. We don't want our marriages and our relationships to be killed. We don't want it to be destroyed. Uh, we, We don't want there to be that kiss of death into those situations. Jesus says, but I have come that you might have life and life in all of its fullness. So shall we just pray? Uh, and commit our marriages and our relationships and everything that is important in our lives to God and ask him to breathe his life once again into us that we would hold to these commandments and live them out and enjoy living them out. These things are written for our correction and for our instruction and to help us to live life uh, to the full. And we thank God for that. We thank God that he cares about us enough that he will speak his word into our lives to help us to live life to the full. Let's pray. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. There's no escaping the truth of your word. And your truth always does set us free, reminds us, gives us a bit of a nudge when we need it. It corrects us. It encourages us that there is absolute forgiveness in you when we do wander and stray. It reminds us that your love for us is unending. So today, as we've looked at this really tricky uh, subject, Lord, we thank you for what we've learnt And we commit to you our our marriages and and, and our relationships. We pray that you would breathe your life into our families, our relationships, our circumstances, and our marriages. Help us to live wisely and carefully, keeping our eyes upon you and focusing upon this beautiful gift that you have given to us with marriage and all that that means where it has been born in your heart and given as a gift to society. We pray all of these prayers in your name, the life-giving name of Jesus, in whose name we pray this morning. Amen.